All right, here we go. Um, again, <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, even if it's one hour late, right? And um, uh, the way we'll, way we'll work is um, um, I have the webinar uh, set up so it's sort of in, in two pieces. And um, uh, we'll go for about, now we'll go for about 50 minutes or so, and then we'll take a quick break for a cup of coffee or something and come back. So we'll take off and maybe five minutes or something between the two pieces of the seminar. Um, and, and like I said, um, uh, if you have um, uh, questions for me uh, as, we're, as I'm going through the webinar, then um, put them in the uh, chat window and I'll either take them as they happen or we'll, um, uh, I'll, do, I'll get back to those after the break. So that's kind of the, kind of the format of what we're gonna be doing. Um, if you saw the um, announcement, the, the print announcement for the webinar, one of the things I said was I was going to give you a little quiz to prepare you for the webinar. And um, um, I have three questions for you I'd like you just to think about before we actually get into the, the webinar itself. First one is, um, what is your favorite type of physical exercise? Like uh, for me personally, it's running. So kind of keep that in mind for yourself. What sort of a, if you had a, if you have time <laughs> and as busy instructors, we often don't have time for exercise, right? Uh, but if you did, kind of keep, keep, keep that kind of in the back of your mind here. Second one is, um, just make a note here um, of for, uh, for your work, for your classroom, what you consider the most um, interesting or difficult um, pronunciation problem that your students have. It's something that we can, we can address in the webinar. And I've left time at the end. So if there's um, something that I have not covered that um, you'd like me to talk about, uh, I'd be happy to. And even after that, um, again, I just, lots and lots of things we can, we can talk about in this webinar. Even if we don't have time at the end, uh, at the very end of the slides, uh, there's my um, email address, and I'd be delighted if you would um, uh, send your questions to me. And I'd be happy to, either myself or one of my graduate students would be just delighted to um, uh, um, answer your questions or send you some materials that will kind of work with it. So, um, just before I, again, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what um, Dr. Alhamani said about me. So maybe I might repeat a little bit of something here. So, but this will kind of help you get a, an idea of, of my background in pronunciation and, and uh, kind of where I'm, what haptic pronunciation teaching is all about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of go backwards from where I am today. So I'm a professor at Trinity Western University that's uh, just outside Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm the director of the uh, MATSAL program. Uh, Dr. Alhamani is one of our most distinguished graduates <laughs> of our, our MATSAL there. Um, and I've been here for about uh, 14 years or so. Before that, I was in Japan for 12 years, uh, doing sort of the same sorts of things, doing teacher training and pronunciation teaching. Before that, I was in Texas for about 12 years, doing many of the same things. Uh, I was the director of an MATSAL program, and particularly that in Texas is where I, I really developed my passion for teaching pronunciation. Uh, I was there at a time when we had, um, uh, during the, just at the end of the um, uh, Vietnam War, and we had a, an enormous uh, influx of uh, people coming from, from Vietnam. And uh, the Vietnamese pronunciation is some of the most difficult on the planet to, to work with. And so I developed um, uh, a lot of the techniques that, that, I'm, that uh, I'll be, some of the techniques I'll be talking with you today about during that period, about 12 years. Uh, before that, I was uh, about, again, yeah, about 10 years, 10 years, 12 years at the University of Michigan, where I, where I received my, my doctorate. And um, while I was there, I was just very privileged to um, study with one of the, um, uh, the most uh, well-known, uh, one, of, one of the founders, really, of work in, in pronunciation teaching, um, 
Professor Joan Morley. Oh, that's M-O-R-L-E-Y. Um, oh, just a note about that too. <coughs> uh, in, the, in the webinar, uh, I will be using, um, uh, in the PowerPoint, you'll see I'll be using the names of researchers and, uh, and, uh, and um, teachers and things like that. All of those are, are available in a, uh, on my blog. In other words, at the end of the webinar, there's a, a link in the PowerPoint, and uh, uh, that will take you to all of these references. So any of, any of these people, if you want to follow up on the research that I've talked about, or uh, just see demonstrations, for example, of, um, of, of these, uh, these techniques and so on, you can follow it that way. So um, uh, again, the, I just noticed someone said this, this, this session is being recorded. Uh, that's great. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> and uh, also, I'll be happy to send you um, a, a version of this PowerPoint. In fact, um, um, what I'll do is after the um, webinar is over, uh, like I often do, I will update the PowerPoint for you. Particularly if along the way, uh, if you and I think of some other things that we want to talk about, and well, I'll uh, I'll I'll uh, add them to the PowerPoint so you have a, a better written record of it. But also with the PowerPoint, um, if you do some practice, you should be able to do these things with your students. So it's kind of built from that perspective. So using the PowerPoint and also using um, the links that I'm going to give you to some videos. I have a, a wide range of videos that will help you with um, uh, using some of these techniques. So with all that together, you should be able, with some practice, you should be able to take these things and, and use many of them in your class, again, depending on what your students' um, students' problems are, that sort of thing. Uh, I forgot one, add uh, one more piece that you have to understand me a little better. Um, before I, after, before my doctoral work, uh, I had, and at the University of Michigan, I had been uh, in the U.S. Air Force for a while. And I was in Germany. I was a Russian interpreter. And um, um, one of my specialties there was working with dialects. So I, and because I enjoy pronunciation, uh, what, um, I began studying different Russian dialects and particularly the pronunciation, the accent that's involved. And so um, for many people, uh, again, I've been in the field for about 45 years or so. <laughs> for many people, they know me because of my work in accent reduction. Um, and today, I'm not going to talk about accent reduction much, but there are links in some of the things that I will give you that kind of can take you there, and you can, uh, can see about that. Um, like I said earlier, in um, terms of exercise, uh, my, my passion is running. I'm also, my other, my other I, have many, I have many passions, I guess, uh, life being one of them, but, um, also, I'm a musician. Uh, I was, my undergraduate work was in music, so that has certainly helped inform my pronunciation teaching, and I still use it in, in all of my, in my work. And finally, I'm a grandfather. I have eight grandchildren, and uh, in a couple of days, I'll be going um, down to the, the U.S. to North Carolina and Tennessee to be with my grandchildren. And uh, as someone interested in pronunciation, we have a, a two-year-old now, and I just love being around two-year-olds as they learn English pronunciation. Okay, I know that's kind of a long introduction, but I think that um, sort of hope that fills you in on kind of where I'm coming from. Um, get here. So here's a slide two. Why, why not teach pronunciation? Let me start there. Sort of on the on the, the, other, the other way around here. Um, it's very interesting, um, as you'll see as we talk a bit, um, pronunciation teaching for a while, uh, well, actually almost 20 years really, um, kind of fell out of favor. And so many of you in your professional training, you may not have gotten any um, uh, formal work in teaching pronunciation. And that was the case with, with many training programs. In fact, even in North American Canada, there are um, MA programs like mine that really spend no uh, time on pronunciation at all. 
And there are many, many reasons. I have some of them listed there for you. <laughs> Takes too much time. My students don't need it, yada, yada, yada. And the, the last one is kind of interesting, particularly here in North America. Um, in new research, the, the last couple of years, that last one, I don't want to make my students feel bad or embarrassing them. And um, uh, that because, um, again, attention to people's um, um, emotions and identity and things like that in, in this culture, in, in North America, um, uh, that has become uh, many people are just uh, don't want to make the students feel bad by correcting their pronunciation. Uh, many other places, many other cultures, that, that's not a problem. Um, but then look at the bottom three arrows there. Uh, in other words, it's okay not to not, it's okay not to because of, one of them is communicative language teaching. My guess is that most of you have, were, have been trained in, um, had training in communicative language teaching and you prob that's probably much, uh, a lot of the things you do come out of that uh, development from the 1980s particularly. And in the early days of communicative language teaching, uh, pronunciation was just dropped in many programs. And um, there were reasons for that. I mean, one of them was that it was in contrast to earlier teaching that was so accuracy and so structure and grammar focused that um, uh, we discovered in, in communicative language teaching that with some attention to methodology, we could get people to speak a lot and to speak fluently and very uh, freely, right? And I'm sure many of you have students who are pretty fluent, pretty verbal, and even fun and engaging, but whose pronunciation is pretty awful. And that's kind of what happened uh, in some, some cases, not always, always, but in some places, the balance between fluency and accuracy uh, kind of got uh, out of kilter, kind of off to one, uh, kind of, uh, um, kind of imbalance that, that had longer term consequences. And that's a bit of what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, and then the bottom arrow says, uh, I've never heard about haptic pronunciation teaching before. Well, you're excused <laughs> if you haven't. Uh, just get a word, haptic. It's basically using more gesture in teaching. And again, I'm sorry I can't see myself. This is a little bit goofy here. We'll get this figured out after the break. Um, but um, I use quite a bit of gesture myself in, in teaching and, and in speaking and just in, um, I think anybody who's in any, almost in any culture who's passionate and, and believes in something or, or in love or whatever, they use a lot of gesture. So the, the idea here in haptic pronunciation teaching is uh, to do what most teachers do anyway, and that is they are energetic and so on, but do it in a more systematic way and trying to use gesture to um, strengthen or reinforce or help with memory and so, ways like that. And that's kind of what, it's very interesting, the kind of the research. So now what I'm gonna talk about the research in some new research uh, that I think will help you understand why the field in general is coming back to pronunciation and why there are a number of developments that have um, uh, make it uh, not just um, um, a good thing to do uh, for a number of reasons, but also uh, we've, we've figured out more and more ways to simplify uh, what we do. Uh, the haptic system that I'm gonna uh, introduce you to is uh, it was ba basically designed for teachers with no background in uh, phonetics or pronunciation teaching or even in language teaching. Uh, we do many, many workshops with these kind of techniques with volunteer teachers. And um, uh, they can do it. Uh, they, I mean, they have to uh, be able, the main thing they have to do is they have to be able to, um, to read a dictionary. So they do have to figure out kind of the phonetic script that their dictionary uses. But if they do that, then um, they, they can do some pretty amazing things with some of the techniques that that we're going to show you. So let me just go through these bullets quickly. Some of them I'll say a word or two about, others I won't. Uh, conversational competence. In other words, for most students, some pronunciation, particularly to get them to whether when we talk, we talk about conversational competence, means that they can carry on a conversation, a two-way conversation, uh, pretty effectively. 
Um, many of them need some pronunciation work. Again, you, you know who your students are, you know what the basic pieces, the basic consonants and vowels and a few things that your students need. So that's a given, right? So some pronunciation attention uh, for most students, particularly if they're going to be interacting with native speakers a lot, is, is really helpful and, and many of them it's essential. Uh, the second one is really is very interesting here. This, um, I, in fact, I'm just doing a, some new research and I'm doing a blog post on the second bullet. Memory for vocabulary, marking stress and key vowels. The idea there is that, um, um, uh, again, if you're working with vocabulary, you're teaching vocabulary, it's common sense that you have them say it, right? <laughs> As part of the process of being able to remember it. Well, interesting new research into um, just how important that is. And, um, and not just um, repeating something with no uh, uh, meaning to it, uh, with no uh, energy, or with no kind of no enthusiasm. So um, working with pronunciation and vocabulary teaching together is, is, ex is extremely good for memory. And of course, we all know that, but it's interesting, like so many things, research is beginning to catch up with common sense. Uh, likewise, marking stress. I think most of you do that anyway, right? I mean, uh, for vocabulary, for example, uh, mark the stress vowel. Uh, their chances of remembering the, the uh, word longer are, are far better. The same thing, what we will do here is um, the key vowel. So in words, we will look at the stressed vowel and use and focus on the pronunciation of that vowel uh, more than the others in the word. And again, in part to facilitate memory for it. Third one is oral reading. Um, again, uh, new research, particularly with children, but even with adults now, that, that a good, effective oral reading is extremely good for memory of, of text and those sorts of things, and also for practice. But it's, it's me, oral reading that is um, uh, more, well, that requires some thought. In other words, not just, just meaningless kind of mumbling and just kind of saying the words and whispering the words or whatever but a way to make uh, some impact on, on the learner in doing oral reading. Uh, likewise, pronunciation work, a uh, number of research on uh, pieces on uh, helping them with self-monitoring. If they have pronunciation work in class, they tend to be better at self-monitoring. And not just self-monitoring their pronunciation, but their um, grammar and vocabulary and other things as well. So what pronunciation work does in part is develop sort of a uh, just a sensitivity to your voice and uh, the, the, the possibility of you hearing uh, something, uh, a mistake that you make or, or hearing a, a difference between what you say and what someone else says uh, will be greater if you've done pronunciation work. Um, uh, the fourth, fifth one is, is sort of the, the ground floor. Uh, some of the things that we'll look at today, P, B, T, H, F, V, stress placement, some things like that. Those are, I think in the field today, just a given. Those you have to do, right? So kind of what we're talking about today is a bit beyond those. I mean, I'll show you the haptic way, uh, a quick way to deal with those, with some of those vowels and consonants, but that's a kind of a, a you have to have those. Um, the, the next to the last one, continuing improvement. Again, the whole idea there is that, um, um, if your students are in a, in a position uh, as they lead beyond your work with them, uh, that um, there's a possibility of them continuing to improve. Keeping pronunciation active in their awareness and continuing to learn new pronunciation, and there are a lot of ways to do that, is, is almost critical for continuing improvement. Um, and again, um, many people, what happens, and you've, I'm sure you, you know them, that you probably have uh, people that you know or colleagues whose pronunciation, whose, whose language fossilized, right? Kind of froze in time. And one of the ways to keep that from happening quite as dramatically is, is like I tell my students, to make pronunciation a hobby. And there are a lot of ways to do that, a lot of ways in, in working with your vocabulary expansion and other things to keep that alive in your, in your work. Um, the last one there in terms of why pronunciation is primary and secondary stress in English is, is um, 
primary stress is critical. Secondary stress is sort of the, uh, you have to get a, a feel for that as you kind of, as you get up above like an intermediate level and above. And again, I'm gonna show you how to, to um, help your students with secondary stress in sentences or secondary stress uh, vowels, for example, in, in longer words. So in some contexts, that too is, is very important. A uh, couple more things here before we get, get to work. Sorry for the, for the theory here, but a couple other things. Um, so, some more reasons to do pronunciation. Uh, what is this possibility of advanced comments later? In our research on people who get, get way up at the top end, uh, all of them have this more of a pronunciation awareness and have developed this, like I said, this pronunciation habit, if you like, of um, just sort of a commitment to um, getting the pronunciation of not just of words, but particularly of um, the melody of the language, of rhythm and intonation, those kinds of things. Again, it's just that it's staying um, uh, committed, if you like, to learning from that perspective. So this is, um, well, again, you know, I love pronunciation. So for me, everything is pronunciation, right? right? I, I think I can, uh, in fact, we, I teach grammar through pronunciation. I have all kinds of ways to do that. But here again, it's just a, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the extreme version. Bill Acton is sort of extreme pronunciation. I love working with it. I love working with the people who do it. Um, and so um, at least some of it, you don't have to be like me, kind of off the deep end, the, kind of the lunatic fringe of pronunciation teaching. But still, if you, if you, if you want your students, if not all students, but many students have natural ability. They get up there just fine, but, but a lot of them don't. And part of it is because the neglect of, the, the, of pronunciation, broadly speaking, kind of in their continuing language development. Uh, next bullet, lots of research on oral comprehension and pronunciation work, speaking pronunciation work, and enhanced oral comprehension. Um, accent discrimination, accent reduction, as I said, is my stuff, what I do, uh, what I've done for years. I work with uh, um, like executives and, and, and managers and people in government and so on who have an accent. They want to uh, tone it down a little bit or adjust it. They want to sound a little bit more like a Canadian, a little bit, a little bit more like an American, or something like that. Right? So, um, and in particularly in North America, and again, I, I don't know much about the research where you, in, in Saudi Arabia and in the sort of Gulf region in general, but in North America, uh, accent discrimination is becoming a big deal. And for example, if you went to a company, you applied for a job and they turned you down and the reason was your accent. Uh, today in Canada and the US, for example, you can take them to court. And there have been a number of successful cases by people who were extremely competent and their language very high, um, um, TOEFL level or IELTS or so on, but their, their, their accent was a bit problematic for someone hiring them and didn't get the job. So that's, a again, a societal change in North America. It has to do with multiculturalism and acceptance of, of different dialects and eth ethnic uh, populations. Fourth bullet, um, look, at all the, look at all the reasons you should be doing pronunciation. Huh? <laughs> Fourth bullet, uh, improved reading fluency. Uh, that's obvious with children. Uh, the oral reading and pronunciation work and phonics with children is very directly connected to oral reading fluency. Um, there's some studies, a couple that, uh, in fact, I can, you'll see in the references, relate the same thing to adults. And I don't mean just all the concepts, but rhythm. I work with rhythm and some things with pronunciation, um, uh, for, for example, um, in a discourse level, where you're looking at what words are, are, are emphasized in discourse, things like that in terms of reading fluency. Uh, there are a number of, of reading for remedi remediate, remedial, excuse me, remedial reading techniques that essentially work with rhythm. You're trying to get people to, um, to read in rhythm groups and, and in chunks and parsing the text. So, it, in terms of children, it's a given, and I think there's all kinds of good research for adults as well, that, that kind of work. Uh, the next one, uh, understanding different English's dialects. I mentioned to you my interest in Russian dialects, for example. Uh, but again, for students, particularly in the global English uh, movement, uh, uh, global English's, 
in doing that, in, in exposing your students to different dialects of English, different Englishes around the world, often it's you have to deal with pronunciation. You have to look at, at a very basic level, maybe, some of the basic differences in pronunciation between these, these, uh, these uh, dialects. And some of the best work in getting students to feel more comfortable um, interacting with people of different dialects comes from some basic work in pronunciation. Um, the next one, how it feels to speak the language. Uh, that's kind of my, my stuff, right? I'm really interested in, in fact, my research. If you look at my publications and things, much of it has to do with the body. And I work with more than just the voice in, in pronunciation teaching. I work with people, I get them to dance. And as you'll see later, I, I get them to use um, <laughs> I got to use boxing gloves and a lot of other things, tennis balls and so on. So, in, but in the process, and there, again, a lot of work with, with done in this kind of work with, with expressiveness and pronunciation. Um, we get them to feel what it's like to speak the language. So, um, to me, that's part of kind of the edge of pronunciation. Uh, and that's the sort of thing some of you, I'm sure, have had some experience in drama. If you have, then you, you get that. Uh, drama, people who, who teach drama are very, very good at getting you to move into the body of the person, that, the actor, or the, uh, the role that you're taking. Um, the, the last two are probably the where we are today in the field, some kind of cutting edge. Of, in fact, some of my own research as well as kind of these last two bullets. That is understanding and interpreting emotion in speech. Um, I'm sure you do that in your classes. I mean, you, you watch a little video clip. You're trying to help your students understand um, uh, what is being expressed by the, the changes in voice pattern and uh, maybe speed and volume and pitch and those kinds of things of the, the actors on the screen. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. Um, we're figuring out more and more in instruction how to describe those things and give students exercises and activities and techniques so they can speak more like that with expressing emotion and that to me that's pronunciation now, some people would say it's not that it's kind of another another area in itself but i there's for me there's no boundary between the two of them right and the last one is under where i think um, much of what's going on today some of the most interesting research in our field has to do with understanding pragmatics that is language use and irony and humor and things like that. And to do that, uh, so often it's expressed with paralinguistic uh, things, uh, sounds and movements, uh, but, it's, but, but particularly um, uh, speed and pitch changes and volume uh, coordinated with facial expressions and all those things, uh, all these nonverbal behaviors that kind of cluster around speech. and. Um, um, but the basic problem we have today, I think, is that we're very good at, at getting people to a point uh, where they can func function in the language. What we're not good at is pragmatics, all of the, the, the nuances and irony and things like humor and so on. Um, how do we get from there to them being able to use those kinds of things? And, and I think pronunciation is part of the answer. And it goes back to one of the first bullets that I had on the previous slide. And that is pronunciation thought more, more broadly as including expressiveness does does some pretty amazing things for people's ability to remember later not just the the words themselves but the context in which the words were said assuming that their body was there in the process and that means speaking it right speaking it speaking to remember and being more accurate speaking to remember is the business of pronunciation. So what do you teach? Now we're almost done here. Thank you for bearing with me for this half hour. <laughs> uh, it'll be fun from here on out. We're just going to look at techniques pretty much the rest of the way out um, uh, for the webinar. So what do you teach? I'm sure most of you do that, uh, the first one already, basic sound discrimination. Um, uh, we're really, today we're really um, um, fortunate to have so much online web-based um, uh, oral, compre oral comprehension and sound discrimination programs and software, easy to get those kind of things and have them available for your students, always very good. Um, 
key vowels, second key, you have, you have to do the key vowels at least for comprehension. So in other words, you don't need to learn, um, you don't have to practice with them in pronunciation work, all the vowels of English. Uh, you gotta get the key ones, and particularly those that are in the stressed syllables, which is the haptic approach kind of focuses on them. Um, and again, that's part of the thing is that, that in the past when we did pronunciation, we sent students through a, a, maybe a year long course in phonetics. Well, that's not necessary. Um, again, it, within, within reason, if they're getting other kinds of feedback and you have some very strategic things that you can do with them. Uh, stress patterns are, are critical, uh, particularly word stress patterns, stress patterns in phrases and sentences in English. And more and more, the, um, um, the publishers of, of, of materials and textbooks and the audios that go along with them are doing a great job of uh, giving students a kind of practice. So they, if they'll just kind of uh, work along with the, with the audios or videos and that sort of thing, that they develop much better stress patterns than it used to be the case. Much better work. Uh, basic intonation. Now that um, just about a half a dozen basic intonation pieces, melody of English intonation. Uh, we'll, 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 we will uh, look at those in a, in a couple of minutes. And this, um, the, the, the word, the second word there, the uh, tracking, uh, tracking or repeating. Tracking refers to um, um, when students try to, like to look at the text and they'll be listening to the audio. They try to talk along with it. Uh, maybe you do that sort of thing already. Uh, but again, um, it's one of the standard techniques now of, of um, a really good online pronunciation work of and particularly in helping people get intonation patterns. It's like they sort of speak along with the words, but, but more importantly, they're focusing on the intonation or focusing on the, the speed and pitch and rhythm and those kinds of things of the speech, not simply the individual words, and the vowels and consonants. Uh, this rhythm sense, uh, one of the techniques we'll use is called the butterfly, which is extremely good at helping students um, control their speech and develop more rhythmic um, patterns and, and groupings. Uh, next one, differences between kinds of English. I mentioned that earlier. Um, particularly, um, again, how you teach that is, uh, uh, it may be the case that, that you don't have to tend too much to pronunciation, but often just giving the students kind of a basic picture of the differences between a few vowels and consonants that make these languages appear so different. But once they get it, once it's like their brains kind of calibrate, uh, kind of which, um, what, which set, what switch sets to uh, determine, distinguish these two languages can make an enormous difference. And I mentioned that's kind of the, the global English movement is part of it. And finally, um, this the last one, expression and, and interpretation. That's what I was talking about earlier, you know, kind of where research is going. That's what's coming. Um, but again, I think it's um, particularly in terms of, of pragmatics and language use and memory, being able to get students to practice expressively in a controlled form um, just has enormous um, uh, potential for what we're doing in the field today. And one more point here, um, much of what you just heard, at least in sort of in, uh, inspir is inspired by the work of Arthur Lessac. Uh, Lessac was um, uh, often thought of as one of the fathers uh, the father of, um, um, in drama, particularly in the field of drama, of stage movement and voice. And the, there's a very famous Lessac method for developing a good speaking voice. One of, the, one of the principles of the Lessac method is after you've been speaking for 30 minutes, make sure you drink something. Okay. So, what are we, we going to do here? Um, this is what I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you sort of the principles of it. It's called the Essential Haptic Integrated English Pronunciation. We call it APE, like A-P-E. And just kind of look at the words in red there. That uh, It's systematic use of gesture. Yes, I did. So, <laughs> so yes, I followed the Lessac method. I'm a Lessac devotee, in fact. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'd be delighted to talk about the Lessac method. Um, um, so on this slide, we got systematic use of gesture, like I've said, integration into all skill areas. So this, what I'm going to talk about here is no matter what you're teaching, whether it's speaking, listening, 
reading, writing, um, vocabulary, grammar, whatever it is, um, using pronunciation to help to, to work um, in all those areas, sometimes serving different functions as to what it's for, but that kind of just a general awareness of pronunciation working in that skill, just the value of it. And the last one, it's, it's more about giving feedback and correction that is about uh, presenting things. Uh, the, the haptic system I'm gonna, well, we're gonna look at here is there's not, there's not a lot of presentation involved. The idea is that you do a little bit of presentation and then you follow up in the classroom by using the techniques. So people are, are made aware of different aspects of sound, get a little bit of introduction to it, a little understanding of it, and, but, but they learn it. It's an embodied process of being in the classroom, working with it just day after day and becomes a very natural process for them. Short history. There's Lessac, someone, uh, who is that? Um, uh, Mahmoud al Haq mentioned um, the Lessac method. Now, that was me back in the 60s. <laughs> I would studied um, the Lessac method, uh, uh, particularly the, um, I, I was, I was, I had a, I thought I, I might be in something to do with entertainment or entertainment or um, I thought maybe I was going to be a folk singer. <laughs> so, didn't work. Um, you know, in, in parentheses are the word Amanda, that's my daughter. And my daughter was diagnosed early on with very severe dyslexia, uh, enormous problems with reading. And using the Lessac method, particularly Lessac's notion that you train the body first, that you, that you get the body feeling the rhythm, moving with the rhythm of speech and things like that. And uh, then you go to the voice. And there's, again, a wonderful... Um, model that Lessac uses. But my daughter, what we, did, what we figured out is my daughter uh, could remember almost anything, almost any vocabulary and those sorts of things if she used her body to um, with gesture and movement and those sorts of things to remember it. And so Lessac's work um, help, really helped me with my daughter. And, and in fact, the work with my daughter back in the, um, Bobby, my daughter was in the, in the 70s, a little bit later, but my work with my daughter really inspired much of what I've done, done since. And the idea that um, bringing the body and gesture into pronunciation work. In about 84, uh, I published an article in TESOL Quarterly on accent reduction. You can find that one. And that's just a system for working with accent, but using body movement and gestures, sort of this, uh, one of the more important uh, features of it or foundations of it. By 2005, I'd begun to work with tactile touch. And so haptic is um, systematic use of gesture, but it also involves using touch. And you'll kind of see how that works. Basically what it means is that you use a gesture and at the end of the gesture, uh, on the stressed word, the hands touch or the hands touch the upper body or something. So it's using touch to further sort of anchor, bring together, reinforce, um, vowel stress patterns or just vocabulary that they're learning and touch is very important to that uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute um, by uh, 2006 i had the first kind of classroom application of, kind of what we're do what we're going to look at here um eight version 1.0 and since then you can see i've kind of developed uh, different um, uh, pieces of it and by 2012 we had this video system about 150 little video clips which you will get access to, and you can look at some, some of them. Uh, particularly if, you're, if you get interested in this stuff and you want to use it in class, the videos would be very helpful. By 2014, we had a kind of a student, kind of a student method in place uh, with, um, with exercise for students and that sort of thing. And 2016, uh, we developed a teacher training system. So if some of you are interested in, in really getting into this, and uh, maybe even uh, if, you're a, if you're a supervisor or a coordinator, and you want to train people in some of these techniques, uh, there's a system for that, and uh, I'd be happy to help you figure out how to, how to, how to get there, how to do that. Um, just a little, little more, for, forgive me, a little bit more theory. Um, you've, you have probably heard of kinesthetic intelligence. Some people are just better at learning through movement and, and uh, gesture and those sorts of things. Uh, lots of research on that. Um, some people are more auditory, some people are more visual, different kinds of intelligence, right? So um, this kind of comes out of that. Uh, um, the, 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 the work comes out of this um, 
of search and gesture and learning and speaking, particularly public speaking. Uh, that anyone who, I'm, probably, I'm sure some of you teach public speaking, uh, giving speeches and so on. And uh, there are a number of techniques, there are sort of body-based techniques that um, are very, very helpful in getting someone to be a better a public speaker. Uh, one of the things, you may, uh, let, me, let me mention this, you may see me bouncing up and down a little bit. Uh, I, may, I always tell people when I do these webinars what that is. I sit on, a, on an exercise ball. In fact, I would recommend that to anybody who, um, who sits too long at the computer like I do, too many hours a day. Um, anyway, so um, again, the, the body, kind of training the body first. Um, second one is, uh, um, second bullet is there are lots of studies of teachers. In fact, a lot of my work, a lot of the gestures you'll see me using in a moment came out of um, research I did with teachers. And I just sat in room and would watch good pronunciation teachers and see what they did. And at one point I began, I would just became really um, uh, struck by the fact that they use so much gesture. And um, many of them, they use the same gestures for the same kinds of things, for differences in pitch or rhythm or um, stress or whatever. And I just figured out over time, um, kind of a system that really comes out of my observations of teachers in the classroom. And like the third bullet, I've been at this, started the, the, the gesture work about 40 years ago, really. And again, it goes back to Lesak and my daughter and, and teaching uh, accent reduction. Kind of, so I've been up about that. Um, and the last bullet's really kind of an interesting one, I think. And that is the idea that um, um, flamboyant instruction uh, in body, image, and culture. And, and the, the point there is that um, uh, one of the problems with pronunciation teachers is they tend to be uh, kind of like me, <laughs> you know, kind of kind of too gesticular and, and too passionate and having too much fun doing it. And it's really interesting research on, on that, particularly with pronunciation, is discovered that sometimes being too, too um, crazy, if you like, or too gesticular or having too much fun interferes with learning pronunciation about as much as it is being boring. So there's this part of it is this it comes down to control. It's controlled gesture, focus, controlled gesture that syncs with the language is what's important, not just just motivation and, and getting people excited. So so there's certain aspects of the process where being excited is is not all that great a thing. But most of the time it usually is. Why happy? Um, the idea here is that we see in red, integrating and prioritizing modalities. Uh, one of the things we know about touch in general is that it brings together, it helps us kind of pull together what we're seeing, what we're feeling, what we're hearing, kind of what's, what's, what's going on in our bodies. And touch is a really unique modality, a unique sense in that regard. Um, uh, the second bullet is that it's moderated exploratory sense. As far as the brain is concerned, we use touch for exploration more than we do for remembering or as a kind of a regular, um, we generally don't uh, use touch to make sure this is a spoon every time. But it's, we're beyond that. But there's an initial point when we're encountering things where touch helps us um, put things together, figure it out. And of course, what we'd like to do is use pronunciation, the same thing, using touch to help pull pronunciation together. Um, it captures the attention. This is particularly good if you have uh, high school students you work with, right? Uh, all you need is three seconds, really, to, to bring together a sound and, and, uh, and the gestures and so on to, to help students kind of focus in on it. You need about three seconds of attention, and normally that's about all you're going to get anyway, so it's good. Lots of examples today. I'm sure some of you, many, maybe many of you have, uh, anybody have an iPhone 10? I, I don't yet, uh, but all of the new iPhones, the later generation handhelds, all have touch, uh, touch and pressure um, controls and, and signaling and so on. That's all haptic, haptic pushback. And um, surgery, gaming is enormous now with all kinds of uh, touch being involved in gaming. My particular interest is in, is, is it has been in prosthetics, that's artificial arms, that sort of thing, because uh, I had a friend who had lost an arm. And, and um, uh, some of the new artificial arms, uh, 
fingers in these in, in the hands and some rain it's, you can feel it what's going on you can feel heat you can feel pressure uh, so haptic is an enormous area enormous area for um, research in our field today so haptic basics uh, and um, I think this is the last <laughs> the last of kind of preliminary things um, so we use gestures they're easy to learn uh, you need to, as I said, you kind of pick this up from Lessac and other comments I've made. You need, you have to have a, a stronger voice, at least a richer voice. And so that there's vocal resonance so the students can kind of feel what they're saying, not they, or, or bring their attention to it. I use um, clear, yeah, clear gesture, clear touch, as you'll see, we're very, uh, we have very, um, it's not kind of like clapping your hand, very discreet touch is involved. Um, uh, next one, or again, the fourth one, synchronizing gesture and sound, say the two together. But the fifth one's really interesting. Repeat gesture and sounds only three times. Now, the, the target in, in our work, like we're trying to get a new word that you want students to learn, um, you try to limit the number of repetitions uh, that they, verbal repetitions, to about three times, and you do it along with them. So in our, in our work, in our haptic pronunciation teaching work, we never say, repeat after me. We say, repeat with me. So we do some kind of a, of a gesture as we say the word, and then we all kind of do it together. So it's kind of group movement. Well, we, we often talk about it as the dance. Uh, likewise, this makes for some, some easier ways to actually do homework. Um, but again, homework in general, uh, how many of you, I wish I could see you and you can raise your hands here. How many of you figure that you, you, um, you, your students do homework and it's worth doing? <laughs> I've done a lot of research on homework, particularly homework in pronunciation. And in general, um, uh, it's not very effective and just very, very few pupil, very, very few successful steps on uh, using pronunci uh, pronunciation homework as being effective. So there are ways to do it. And I think with, with the haptic system and some of the things I'm going to show you, uh, there's, there's ways to do it, and there are ways to do it more effectively. And finally, uh, uh, smile. This is really fun and effective. Um, you have to get the smile. I'm, yeah, I don't know. I can't uh, prove you to be a haptic pronunciation teacher unless you smile. So. Okay, I'll tell you a lot. Let's see how are we doing here. Oh, no, I'll, we'll do the warm-up. Uh, we were um, about five minutes away from a break. So let's the warm-up first. Now this is going to be tricky because I can't see myself, right? So I'm going to stack a bit. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to lead you through a warm-up. Uh, and um, um, this is what we let's show what the warm-up is here. This is a typical warm-up that we do in 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 pronunciation teaching in general. But this is a haptic version. It basically kind of gives you um, a tour, if you like, of Kind of basic English vowels. And so for the student, the student is, we, we call this the vowel clock here, right? Um, and um, so what I'm going to do with you, what we will do together, is that we will have a, a, we'll do some gestures, kind of moving around a bit like this. Step back. This is going to be tricky. Uh, but I'll tell you what, somebody, uh, text message, just tell me, please tell me if you can see, uh, you need to see me from, from about the waist up. See, so I'm back here. Somebody tell me, please. Can you see kind of up here in my head, or I need to move the screen? Am I good here? Can you see this area like that? Does that work? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'll try to bend down a little bit, gang. So what we're going to do is um, just just do it. I'll, I'll do the gesture once and the sound, and then you do it after. Okay? Got that? And we'll do it together once, then you do it with me the second time. Sorry, that wasn't clear. We give you an example. So first one will be, we're just going to do um, the ball at 1 o'clock. So you put your hand here. You actually always come back to your, uh, to your vocal or your mouth, basically. So you, you have to do this with me. Everybody stand up there, wherever you are. Or I'll actually do it seated, seated if you're on a ball or something. So here we go. We'll do a little, just a basic warm-up. I'll give you kind of a feel for what kind of some of the things we do. So first one is E. Do it with me. E. Now we'll go the other way. Ooh. Ooh. 
Everybody doing it? Uh, okay. <laughs> hey. Hey. Over here. Oh. 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 Okay. Now we'll do the same one. Let's put a, uh, put a on glide. A Y on glide at the beginning. For example, ye. Got that? Again? Ye. So Y is up here, right? So we're going from Y is kind of 12 o'clock. So you. Got that? You. Next one is yay, right? Yay. Yay. Good. Yo. Yo. Now notice, um, um, I'm a little bit um, energetic here. It doesn't have to be done quite like this. Uh, you can do it very discreetly with your students, particularly at the beginning, to get them more comfortable just even moving their body. And particularly, many people have difficulty to even coordinating the movement with their voice. And again, they're particularly if they're, they're particular, there are particular professions where that's very, very valuable to be able to do that, right? Right. So, so it's just I'm doing it with you. Um, your professionals. I'm doing a little more energy with you, but you don't have to be done quite this exaggerated. Okay. Now, next one um, we'll do. Let's do W. I'll put out a W on glide at the beginning of the word. So here we go. We, we. You see what I'm doing? We got kind of a circle in here. Get that? We. Now with the other side, woo, woo. Now way, way, whoa, whoa. Now I'm just using those four vowels. We could do short vowels, or just use those four long ones, but we can also do the diphthongs of English. So let's do those. So I'm going to go from six o'clock up to 12 o'clock. So like this, I, everybody. I now go over here from six o'clock up to eleven o'clock, basically. Ow, ow. Now we'll go from um, um, eight to twelve. Oi, oi. Now we'll go from five, five o'clock up to eleven. Ow, ow. Another exercise we do, this is from Lessac. Someone mentioned Lessac. This is one of Lessac's favorite exercises. A little bit strange, but let me just show you how it kind of works. Hold your wrist like this and go forward and make um, ooh, ooh sound. That's about 11, 11 o'clock. Ooh, ooh. Got three times. Ooh. Okay. This is Lessac now. Another one of less acts was to begin in the center. You begin kind of here. And you're going to use ah, the vowel six, six o'clock, ah. You can do it this way. So you go from down here, you go ah, ah. Same thing, ah. Going out the side, ah. And from down here, ah, ah. Now, that was sort of a quick tour. That's the idea. No, I like many ways to do it, but the idea is to get students just moving a little bit. So even if you did the diphthongs with your students, you did I, I just conducting it like a like a choir conductor. That's good. If it's just the idea of once you get people to move along with you, if you can get them to gesture with you just a little bit, eventually they'll come along and their bodies will engage. But it begins slowly, a slow process. Okay. Let me just a couple more slides here. We'll take a, we'll take a coffee break. Um, what I just did, you can see on this next slide, uh, kind of where I was where I was moving. So one is kind of up here, right? One one eleven one eleven are up here, and two and ten are kind of in here, right? That's where I was headed, and three vol three and vol nine are in here, and vol. Four and eight are down here, and then a little bit lower down is um, <laughs> right. A little bit lower down, lower down is um, uh, five, six, and seven down there. And of course, what that is, um, I'm sure all all of you will recognize it when I mention. Of course, that that's the IPA chart, right? Uh, well, we've just taken the IPA chart and stuck it onto the clock. 
The uh, only thing is, as you will notice, it's for the, for the students, the IPA chart is backwards. It's flipped. Uh, for the instructor, it's really a good deal because, you know, no problem for you. But for the students, the notice that the, um, the um, uh, E, and U, E, I, A, A, those vowels, notice those. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I kept, are these, the question is, are these haptics related to place and manner of articulation? Yes, they are. Absolutely. Again, part of this was Lessac's idea. Lessac's idea was to get to anchor, anchor sounds to movement. And once you, once you do that, then the brain associates the movement with the sound, and you can do the movement, which changes the sound. That's the whole, yes, exactly, exactly how it works. So this is place of articulation, high, mid, low, and front and back, exactly. Um, and again, that, that's, a, that, that's a strange IPA chart, it's flipped, and I can talk about that later. That's based in neuroscience and, and the right, your, your right and left hemisphere of the brain, a whole bunch of things that kind of back up the idea of flipping that chart. In fact, you, you, who, you all of you have studied phonetics, or probably a little bit, and did you know that the choice of having the IPA chart going from uh, left to right was arbitrary? It didn't have to be that way. Uh, Daniel Jones and some others just kind of did it that way, right? Uh, anyway, in our work, we do it a different way, and I can get into that more later. Um, I think I'll stop right there. Let's everybody please take five, and uh, let's re, re get back together in about five minutes, and we'll start with, uh, you can see what we're going to start with here. We'll start with the, um, I'll show you how to work with these short vowels in English with your students. A little simple little, little trick here using the clock. And how to, um, um, get the pronunciation and how to remember it. So what time is it now? Let's take, um, give me five minutes and we'll come back together. I'm gonna have another cup of coffee. <laughs> I figured it out. Oh, great. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, this will go much better now. So I can see myself and we've been doing all the haptic work. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I should have been able to figure that out sooner. I'll be right back.
How's the sound now? Is it okay? You hear me okay? Excellent. I had a good question uh, before the uh, before my uh, web connection went went out there for a second, and it was about uh, the idea of um, I can't remember who it was from. Sorry, I can't remember who said it. it may have been from um, uh, may have been from uh, Abdullah. Um, his question was talking about um, um, it, uh, whether pronunciation should be taught um, like as a, a class or something, or whether it should be integrated into everything. Uh, absolutely, it should be uh, the whole point of what I'm going to do here is these are techniques that you can use in any class. You don't have to be a pronunciation teacher. Um, I mean, I, I really, I mean, if, if you have a, uh, the perfect system, would be one where you had some somebody who, where the students could maybe do it online or something, or have a, a very brief pronunciation class where they could be introduced to things, and then you use them in speaking, listening, reading, writing, vocabulary, and so on. That's the whole model, right? Uh, of integrating it into everything else, not being pronunciation being something separate, some sort of a separate skill. That's the whole point of what we're doing here. Okay. Again, sorry about, sorry about the, uh, the web connection here. Let's get back to work here. We've got lots to do. Um, so we, we're, we're looking at this, this slide, single vowels. And we have, um, could be short vowels, called something like that. There are many different ways to describe them. But let me just show you kind of what the, how we teach the students uh, what these are about. So um, remember what I did earlier when I... Uh, we did a warm up. This is something similar. So, what, what you do is put your hand at two o'clock over here someplace, right? About two o'clock. And we're going to do that. We'll do the key word coming from here. Remember, we always start at the, at the voice and go out to it. So, it's chicken, like that. Chicken, two o'clock. So, you could do the, the key word chicken, chicken, or you could do just the vowel itself, which is it. In fact, the, the transcription that you have there is. It's not, that's not a good phonetic transcription. It should be the short vowel, it should be a capital I, not that one. So, chicken. This is actually kind of a fun little sentence. So it's chicken, vowel two. Now I'll do 10 o'clock, cooks, and do the sound that goes with it, uh. All right, so it's uh. And then go to four o'clock, put your hand on the clock at four o'clock, go down to four, it's best. The sound is? Eh, right? Eh. And then eight o'clock is salt. So salt. And the vowel there is aw, right? Aw. And then go back over to seven o'clock. And the vowel there is uh, to the word the word is love. So love, right? And the vowel is uh. And then vowel five. Keyword is fat, fat. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, fat. Sorry, Sorry. I got turned around here. Vowel five, fat. And then in the center is hot and water. So it's just hot water. So notice what we're doing. We go, we put our hand, uh, give this, the, the one hand goes to the position on the clock. The other goes from the voice out and back. So it, it sounds something like this. I, u, e, o, a, 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 a. So if you're correcting or helping a student with a word or something, and you wanted them to get PMP, PMP, that's pedagogy movement pattern. You just go out and, and get that. Now, your students, uh, you, you, because in, in, um, in Arabic you have long and short vowels, they can kind of get the general, they don't have a great deal of problems with them. Um, problem will be the, like the difference between E and I, perhaps in terms of vowel length and that sort of thing. 
and we'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. But anyway, the con concept of clock and the and the vowels at these various positions. And again, this points of articulation in the mouth. The upper part of the upper, mid, and lower. Oh, it's exactly what it is. Using gesture to remember it, and then later change it using the same thing. Videos of um, Introducing to it. Okay. That's the basic idea of, of haptic, <laughs> haptic teaching. It's in space, anchoring the sounds, gesture. And then later, you can use the gestures to change the sounds. So that's, where, that's the basic point. Well, gang, I apologize for the for the um, someplace between here and Saudi Arabia. Things, are <laughs> the web is getting getting busy. Oh, so here's an example. One, uh, two of them, uh, how you use this this haptic haptic system. So you can see those see the sentences that I have there, and underneath it are the vowel numbers. And so, for example, just let me just do one sentence. You can see how it works. So, let's just do the first sentence. That one a. So five is here. Four. Four is here, and two is up here. So it'd be something like, that smells delicious. Ah, eh, it. Ah, eh, it. Then you can see the rest of them. The same thing for the other vowels and the, just the positions in space and with the body. Uh, look at 2B, at the very end of 2B. Notice there, it's, it's um, so B is a cookbook. Uh, cookbook that I bought from, notice I have six or eight there. Um, depending on uh, uh, what, what brand of English you speak, I mean, Bob, Bob rather than Bob. Uh, again, I'm, I grew up in Michigan. So my vowel in, in Bob is six to have the vowel eight instead. So again, yeah, just an example there of, of even in our teaching where there are a number of a number of vowels like that where it could be either one depending on which which um, major English um, a variety you use. So anyway, just an example of how that works. Let me get let me get the the comment the chat back here. My chat fell off. <laughs> yeah, that one, uh, Mandy says, um, Fox interesting, you betcha. Still remember how boring, how, how boring it was. Oh, absolutely. And you can see, actually, you know, this really is an attempt um, to make it less boring, right? And we, we find, too, that if you, particularly if you teach strategically, you don't have to teach your students all the vowels, just the ones that, that, um, that they need. Um, and particularly if, if you begin using them with um, a vocabulary, then you're, gonna, you're going to make sure that they have a pretty, a pretty accurate pronunciation of the stressed vowels only. 
And I'll show you that in just a minute. We're going to go on here in just a second here to that. So, so we, we just did half of the vowels of English. We did the uh, short vowels. Now let's look at the what we call double vowels. And um, um, some of you may, may teach these as, um, I mean, again, from an Arabic perspective, you, you have long and short vowels. In English, technically, we have long and short vowels too. The difference is, particularly for some um, types of English, like North American English, uh, like um, uh, Canadian and American, we have um, double, more of a double vowel. In other words, um, um, for, well, let me show you. Uh, compared to British, the, the British have some uh, British English has long, so like long vowels, um, longer vowels, as opposed to what we do, what, what Americans would, would do. So let me just show you how that works. Here. <laughs> Again, I teach another course I teach sometimes. I love teaching. I teach phonetics, but I teach phonetics haptically. So all the sounds of every language done using gesture or representation in space. So let me show you how these go. Again, same simple, simple idea. So you can see it there. So look at vowel one Y. One Y, here's one o'clock, remember? One o'clock's up here, and Y is up here. So it's just one Y. So it's E, right? E. Now, um, again, in, in British, British have, have vowels like, their, their, their vowel for she may be more E, E, maybe a little bit of an off glide. Um, American and Canadian have a strong off glide, E, right? Same thing for vowel three. You can see three Y there, A, E, right? A, E. So many students, for example, the problem they have is between a, like for example, one of the most common vowels in the world are e, a, simple vowels, where there's no, right? And so for them, the problem is that if you do, in English, if you use a, a, people are going to hear eh, right? So you got to have the a, e for American and Canadian English. Not quite so much the case with British English, but very close anyway. Yeah, you can see the vowels there. And so uh, the, the, the key, key sentence, let me just show you the key sentence we use for this. So it's she, three Y, may, then we go six Y, six Y, right? Like, right? And then eight Y, the boy, right? And then six W, now, right? And then nine W, and his boat, boat, and then 11W, two, two. Again, I don't expect, <laughs> I don't expect you to remember how to do that, but again, if, you want, if you're interested in this, uh, there are easy ways to access the, the videos. But you can see, see the, what I was doing there, that, that the difference for students, for a student, the difference between, for example, uh, it and E, well, actually, in terms of phonetic space in the mouth and movement, is very, very, very short. We often talk about tense and lax vowels, right? It's tense, you're moving your jaw or something. But for the students, they see this I and the E. Say, wow, that's really a big difference. Well, in phonetic reality, is it's not, but haptic reality, it is. And so again, that's, that's, that's the idea here of moving to gesture and then letting, helping gesture control the body. Again, this is not a big problem for your students, so I'm not going to spend much time on this one. It's a big problem for Japanese and Spanish speakers and a number of others that, that, where that, um, uh, that contrast between E and it and A and E and U and U, those contrasts are enormously important to them, but not so much for you. Yeah, right. Thank you. Javed Ahmad, it is related to pedagogical movement patterns. Exactly. A pedagogical movement pattern is a gesture, some kind of sound, and touch on the stressed element or touch on the main uh, focus of, of the movement. Exactly. Good. Thank you. Good students. You get an A. <laughs> the chat window just fell down. I mean, move it up a bit so I can see better here. Okay, here we go. Again, I'm going pretty quickly here, but again, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, it's an easy, easy way to find out about it. You can, let me just, you see it here? See what's going on in this next slide? Same thing, right? 
How can it be explained cognitively? How does the connection between haptics and the mind processing take place? Um, Tim, I'm going to come back to that at the end about the uh, how you explain kind of what's going on in the brain and what this is about. Obviously, it's the idea of, of, of connecting modalities in the brain and that part of the brain where the visual and auditory and touch all kind of interact is trying to bring those together. Anyway, we'll come back to that. It's a good question. Um, the teacher needs to be well practiced before presenting in front of students. There's a mismatch. Um, yeah, I, I guess so. But I mean, um, you're not going to do all of them, right? Uh, you know your students are having trouble with just one or two things. You just do that. You don't present them the entire system right up front. You don't do that. You just do a little bit, a little piece at a time, right? So um, I mean, there are ways to do it where you present them the whole system and so on, but you don't have to. Uh, again, some of the, the next techniques uh, will make more sense like that. So, so anyway, see what's going on here. Same, like, excuse me, would be, would be, um, um, excuse me, right? Excuse and how, so on. So the idea there is just getting, particularly in English, to get these double vowels rather than the, um, um, the simple, simple vowels. Okay. I mentioned, um, right here. so I mentioned, well, this is more, more interesting. This is vocabulary. So look, notice this one. Say we want to anchor different, um, help them remember vocabulary. So notice the words in red. And what we do is then we use the pedagogical movement pattern, the PMP on the stress syllable only. I'll just do a couple of those for you. So, so B3 is over here, right? You can do this with me. Pronunciation, pronunciation, pronunciation. Next one, international, that's it's five, five o'clock. International, international. Uh, next one is methodology. Let's do that one, both American and um, British. So methodology, American is six. Methodology, methodology. But if you're British, you probably use eight. Put hand over here at eight o'clock. Methodology, methodology, and so on. Yeah, anyway, you get the idea. So, and there is where, where you mentioned your comment about teaching, yeah, someone that goes well with action verbs. Absolutely, it really does. We, in fact, we try to use action verbs. Uh, but you can see that, that there, um, um, I mean, you don't have to teach this in advance. You can just, for that word, just do it. You're right, you make a little note for yourself and you do the PMP with your students while you do it. You may not even tell them. Someone's meaning the primary stress. Yes, this is primary stress, exactly. You can do secondary stress too. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So, so together, many teachers don't even show the students the, 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 the charts or anything. They just do it for key vocabulary words. They tell the students, now, here, gesture along with me this way on the primary stress. That's all I do. And it works great, right? Um, this is, maybe you know this, you do this with your students, word families. Well, there's like, again, going from photo, you can see the same thing how you would put the PMP on the stress syllable as the stress syllable changes, or as the vowel quality changes from, from nine, you have that nine W once you get photo, then photographic, photography, then photogenic, photographic, <laughs> photographical, photographically, and so on, right? So all you're focusing on is, as you said there, the stress syllable. It's a reconciliation between speech and action. Oh, interesting. I like the word. I, I've never used that word before that um, Asherir just said it's a reconciliation between speech and action. Oh, huh. yeah, I like that. I, I, like that con I like that concept. In fact, yeah, in fact, you know, that is a great idea, in fact. You know, there's a, it's, it's really a reconciliation between the mind and the body is what it is, right? It's like, you know, I'm, you've probably read about, you know, Descartes. You know, I think, therefore, I am. You know, well, that, that's often what we all, I often refer to that. In fact, there's a book, there's a book entitled Descartes' Error. Descartes' Error was to separate the mind from the body. And that's exactly what it is, what Sharia was talking about, is this reconciliation between the two. The last one is six. Photographically. Well, <laughs> 
photographic. <laughs> British, you're right. <laughs> okay, right. Oh, yes, Dukhil is right. The last one should be photographically. That's British, yeah, as opposed to my, that's my American. Sorry about that. Sometimes students don't make a stress syllable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, how to say, behind is saying, sometimes students don't make it stressed out enough. Exactly. Putting a PMP on, <laughs> putting a PMP on a stressed syllable takes care of it. You don't have to tell them to speak louder. You don't have to tell them anything. Just have them put the gesture on it, and it automatically brings that out. Excellent point. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just, uh, we've we got to go on here. don't have enough time, but you can see you can do it other ways, too. Here we have Saudi, Saudi Arabia, United States, William Acton, and so on. And this, this last one is from uh, Mary Poppins, the supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Same thing, you can do that one. We do with students, they, they put PMPs on su fra ex do. So it's, um, so it's supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. So supercalifragilistic expialidocious and so on. Not any, you can do anything like that with a dialogue. Sometimes students don't make stress syllable so stand up proud enough. In spite of learning English, how does learning stress make, it will, will make, make a difference? It's extremely important in terms of comprehensibility. Again, that comes back to the fact that in English, when we're listening, when anybody listens to you, they're really, what they're picking up is the stressed elements. And you can make all kinds of mistakes in unstressed syllables if your stressed syllables are elevated enough so people can get the gist of what you're saying. Well, the biggest problem Japanese have, for example, is exactly what you're talking about. They don't make enough contrast between stressed and unstressed syllables. And pretty soon, people just give up. Right? <laughs> it, just, it just wears you out trying to figure out what is important and what isn't. Yeah, very good question. All right. Uh, now... Next one, syllable butterfly. Uh, this is to teach rhythm groups. So in English, uh, these rhythm groups contain um, one or two important syllables, whether louder or stronger than the other one. Um, for example, I'm very happy today. That's kind of one rhythm group. We've got I'm and happy. I'm very happy today. I'm very happy today. So we're talking about these rhythm groups in English. They're up to about seven syllables. There may be, and, and there may be several uh, uh, rhythm groups in a sentence or a clause, like um, I'm very happy today because, you're, I'm, because I'm doing this webinar with you. I'm very happy today because I'm doing this webinar with you. So I have one, two, three. I'm very happy today because I'm doing this webinar with you. Four. So we have four of those. Wait, I have a question here. Uh, um, quick question from um, from Meta about um, about beyond pu puberty. Uh, main thing I tell them is that that um, uh, research <laughs> research just doesn't hold that up at all. Uh, we, study after study shows that that ad adults, I mean, within reason, can develop quite quite adequate pronunciation. Not perfect. Uh, you're never going to get a perfect accent, but uh, part of it is just teaching. It's just good method, with good methodology, um, you can do an enormous amount with adults in terms of good intelligible pronunciation. I'm sorry I don't have more time for that, Nada. I'd love to dance on that one. That's one of my favorite topics, but uh, got to get going here. Um, the butterfly, uh, this butterfly is, um, oops, excuse me. The butterfly is based on, um, I got this from, from psycho, psychologists. Maybe you've seen this, maybe, I don't know, maybe you've done this. You know, one of the techniques they use when people are really distracted or nervous is they have them do this it's called the butter it's called the butterfly technique and um, and um, so we adopted this same idea for teaching rhythm well, let me show you how this works hey can everybody see the, the PowerPoint can you see it because I've got a message here no oh, good thank you okay so let me show you how this works the idea here is you want your students to get these um, stressed and unstressed syllables of tone groups, right? 
So I want you to take your left hand, take your left hand, put it on your right shoulder, okay, there, and put your other hand, so you're tapping down here, your elbow. And it's just, it's a very simple technique. It's like this, for example, tough. So stress syllables are up here, tough. You do that? Tough. Now let's say that's tough. So tap down here, unstressed syllable, that's tough. That's tough. So notice you're tapping very lightly down here, heavily up here. You can hear it up here. Very, very lightly down here. That's tough. Let's take re tough. That's very tough. Let's take a longer word. Let's take um, um, interesting. All right? So interesting would be stressed up here in first syllable. Interesting. Do that. Interesting. Do it again. Interesting. Interesting. Let's do that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. Let's take that's very interesting. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So see what's going on there? What that does is it's a wonderful job of isolating questions here. Somebody raise their hand. <laughs> Oh, I see. Okay. Well, rhythmic like is longer. Happy is good for students, but teachers. Oh, I'll come back in just a second. Anyway, wait, wait. wait. Sorry, Mike. So you get the concept here. So what you're doing is stress syllables up here, unstressed down here. And so what we do is we do, we do these. We do dialogues with it, and you can see below the dialogue, you can see the, um, uh, the, the omega and then the little dots. So for example, the first one is, it's welcome to, welcome to, then it's Bill's fast food drive through all right? And then, may I take your order? Let's do that sentence. So. Start with welcome to. So, welcome to, do it again. Welcome to, then Bill's fast food drive through. Good, right? Again, Bill's fast food drive through. And then, may I take your order? May I take your order? So, you can see that can get, we use that all the time. This is an extremely popular technique we're using. I guess something is really messing me up. Just hang on, just kidding. Okay. Is this stuff notation? Yes, it is. This is notation. That's exactly. You can see how we do it. Now, you don't need to use um, um, what we do, um, omega, anything, box or something, just something to help the students know which one is stress, which one isn't. Wonderful technique. Uh, we use it all the time. And we use it for teaching vocabulary, or for dialogues, for example. Related to music and rhythm? Absolutely. This, these are the basic, what they call the rhythmic feet of English. And the number of syllables that can be in one beat in English. And it's different. Uh, American, the American dialect is different than British, right? And so American dialect will have, can have more syllables in one foot. Same with Canadian. Canadian is a little bit different too. But anyway, that's, you get the idea. Really simple. Now, I just showed you the... the, the um, um, the butterfly, but you can do the same thing with what we call the Tai Chi. And I'll just show you how that works. So you just begin in the conductor's position, and Tai Chi is just like this, going back and forth. And I got this from my wife. My wife studies Tai Chi, and it's one of the moves they use. It's basically like you're dusting off your hands, like that. So you can do the same thing with same same idea. You can do something like, welcome to Bill's Fast Food drive through May I take your order? <laughs> Let's do that again. So, so again, just welcome to Bill's fast food drive-through. May I take your order? 
Again, we use that one in class all the time, particularly if your students are pretty good at the butterfly, if they have a good feel for it, just use the Tai Chi. Just a simple, like you're dusting off your hands, something like that. Wonderful. The Tai Chi is, can be used, Tai Chi is particularly good when you have, if you want students to practice a dialogue, an oral reading, or, or like a role play, and they're getting ready for it, Tai Chi works. Something like that. Next thing, let's look at um, um, intonation. We call these tachinamis. That's, that's um, this is from tsunami. You know the, the word tsunami, a big wave and touch. So these are touch waves. Remember I told you I spent uh, 12 years in Japan and this kind of came out, came out, came from Japan as well. So the, again, there's really common sense here. This is not a, uh, this is just fact, these actually, all of these, I think, I got from watching teachers in class. Some things they did, basically where these came from. So you have, so you have flat, you have fall, you have rise, and you have rise fall. What those are, those are the basic, kind of basic four uh, intonation patterns of English, right? Flat, fall, Rise and rise fall. Let me show you how it works. Let's do a little bit of this one. You can see the word we have in bold face. This is going to be flat. So your hand is palm down. It's going across it flat like so. Something like this. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Next one is fall. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And rise is... Um, um, he has like this, you're from BC, you're from BC. Notice what's going on here. I'm touching on the stress syllable. You're from BC. Then rise fall, pronunciation, pronunciation. And I'm out of here, final fall, meaning it's, it's over, the final part of the conversation. I'm out of here. The next one is fall rise, same idea. Are you serious? Are you serious? And the last one is rise, fall, final fall. You've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. The rise, fall is every pronunciation, every teacher, every English teacher's favorite Pachinami is a rise, fall. For example, nice to meet you. Sit down, please. Open your books. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> Rise fall, right? Too much enthusiasm. Okay. Now, so you can do, you can do, and again, I'm just giving you examples of what you could use. Use. You don't have to do touchy-namis just like me, right? Anything like that that involves just a gesture and touch to go along with the sound. That's, it's got a question here. Speed with intonation to be balanced, left hand is static. That's correct. Yes. Oh, no. The, um, yeah, the, um, um, the right hand is static. Yeah, the left hand moves. Right. The, the, the right, in fact, the right hand, your right hand, I, I, this mirror image, okay? Mirror image. Your right hand, my left hand, your right hand. This one is where information is located. The other hand is the melody. This is almost like left, like um, um, left brain, right brain, and left brain, right? This is this is digital. This is analog over here. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. So the baton's the same thing. In fact, baton is really really helpful. Let me just get a pencil. Let me show you how this works. So you hold the baton, you hold the baton in your left hand, or my right hand, your left hand, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing we did with the touchinamis but we're just gonna use a pencil. In fact, even better is if you've got a, um, a longer stick of some kind, uh, but, a, but a pencil is fine. Let me just show you how this works. So, like, here's the, the dialogue, flat. I'll think about it, I'll think about it, flat. Then a fall, just a regular fall in English is, nice to meet you. When you do this, let your hand relax. Nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Or rise, you from BC, 
You from BC? <laughs> Again, common sense, right? right? Or uh, rise, fall. Pronunciation, pronunciation, pronunciation. Or final fall, final fall, fall. I'm out of here. Now that fall on the end there, that what that means is that's some, um, excuse me, but my ball keeps running away from me. That fall means your voice drops as much as possible. It's like at the end of um, when you're finished in a conversational turn or you're finished speaking. Let me see here. Question? Oh. Um, so this says, so says, thanks. WH and yes, no questions, please. Well, yeah, sure. Um, about 60% of yes, no questions <coughs> are in the fall. Like, um, um, are you going home? Are you going home? Right? Are you going home? Or are you going home? Are you going home? So yes, no questions typically, no, I'm sorry, I had it backwards. Yes, no questions typically have a rising intonation, 60%. Are you going home? But they can also be, are you going home? Which has a different meaning, right? Uh, this one is a little more aggressive, and more of a statement of fact. Are you going home? Are you going home? WH questions are almost always, um, what time is it? What time is it? Now again, if I repeat that question, I might say, what time is it? What time? I might, I might. But WH are normally fall, and yes, no, 60% rise. But some are, some are a fall as well. Echo question. Uh, yeah, right, exactly, echo question. Yep, good, okay. All right, now, um, now for this one, you're gonna need a piece of paper. So, um, Actually, you should have boxing gloves, <laughs> or uh, boxing gloves, or like for example, um, <laughs> when we do this, when we use tennis balls, <coughs> but you can also take a piece of paper, kind of wad up. See if you got if you got heavy paper, so you can wad up like that, something like that. And this is called the Fight Club. This is the most popular. We have uh, we have tournaments. Uh, pronunciation tournaments where people put on boxing gloves and they fight each other and um, usually gender specific where the, the women fight each other and the men fight each other but here in North America you know we <laughs> we also have tournaments where some of our classes where the women fight the men paperweight yeah paperweight category very good outstanding perfect paperweight category exactly um, in boxing paperweight right uh, cool <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys are brilliant today. Um, so, uh, same deal here. Same, same idea. We're gonna, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna crunch and punch on stressed syllables. So just what we've been doing on the other stuff too. You can, you can look at this one here. Let me just show you what it looks like. So, so what you do is you have the students, um, you can have the students do it in right or left hand, but I'm gonna do it only like we do it in class. So put the, the paper in your right hand, okay, like this. So it's, it's cool, cool. Now for that's cool, see the arrow going back the other direction? You go back first. That's cool. Then for really cool, you go out, back, out. So really cool, really cool. Anyway, get the idea? The idea there is that, that on the unstressed syllables, if there's one unstressed syllable, you go back. If there are two, you go out and back. If there are three, you go back, you know, <laughs> back, out, back, out, so on. So what we do is, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go write the dialogue here. So you can see there, like, like, look at devastating. So devastating, look at that's very devastating, that last one. So for that's very devastating, you go back, forward, back, out, and punch. So that's very devastating. So that's very devastating. Right? And we have students practice that a bit. And um, again, you don't have to have them do this in advance or anything. You can just, even, even if they can put their keys in their hand, that works. Anything they can put in their hands, they can squeeze so they feel the stress. They feel the energy of the stressed word coming through on the punch they go out. 
But again, I, I'm, if you go online, we have videos of, of me doing it with boxing gloves and with, we've got, I've got about a dozen pairs of boxing gloves that students use. And we have, I use this particularly with people who are doing accent reduction. I do a lot of this stuff to help them just be more confident and to be stronger and more definite in their speech and things like that. Um, I don't, I don't have, a, I probably don't have, well, you can, you can, this is what the dialogue looks like. See that? See how it works? I'll just show you one. So it's, so for example, that first one would be, hey, right? The next one is, can I help you? Hey, can I help you? Hey, can I help you? And so forth. And then, and then the, like this next one, we got a disaster at the house. So you're going to go out first. We, so we got a disaster at the house. We got a disaster at the house. So notice what we got there. We had four, and we had four, um, four syllables before the stressed one, and then out here and squeeze on that one. So that's the Fight Club, and again, um, um, all kinds of ways to work with that. Um, one more thing about before we kind of get out of this this area here, what we call the advanced touchinamis. Remember, we did the touchinamis that were flat, fall, rise, and rise, fall. Remember those? Well, you can do the same thing um, um, with um, expressiveness. So, for example, you can do, um, let's say you had, um, you can do things at three pitch levels, high, mid, and low. So, it's, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. You can use secondary stress. We call looping. For example, let's take that one again. That's nice. Well, um, in American English, typically it's just one fall. That's nice. But in Canadian, they tend to do that's nice. That's nice. So they have more energy on secondary stress. So they do a loop. That's nice. Americans, where I'm from, Michigan would say that's nice. That's nice. Canadians tend to do that's nice. British also tend to put more energy, a little more energy on secondary stress. So we call it the loop. You're just looping your hand, to put a little more energy, a little more gesture, volume, and so on into that, that word. Uh, we have, you can do tag questions. <laughs> Every grammar teacher's favorite grammar structure. So a tag question could be something like, um, that's nice, isn't it? That's nice, isn't it? Right? That's it. Fall rise, or if you're Canadian, that's that's nice, eh? Right? Or you can have the fall fall version of it. That's nice, isn't it? That's nice, isn't it? Just falling away with the final fall. That's the pop, the positive one. That's nice, isn't it? That's nice, isn't it? Again, what are we doing here? We're just trying to figure out some external gesture that you can anchor a sound pattern to. That's the concept. And there are so many ways to do this. Again, you can figure out your own way to do it. But you get the idea. It's just concept here is what's important. Okay, now we got look at uh, about 10 minutes left. Um, oh, or ironic it is. Is it? Or ironic? It is, is it? <laughs> That's a... Uh, me high just give me a lot of trouble. Okay. <laughs> now, um, I'm going to do a little bit with consonants. Finish up here. Um, and it, to do consonants, you have to have a stick. Now, um, this, is, um, this is from a coffee house, making coffee, coffee stick, right? We do a lot of things with sticks if we're doing consonants. And, and the this, this slide is teaching protocol. Um, what do you do? Well, first you... Describe it, metacognitive, you explain it. You model it a bit, then you touch various places, then you set the, set the jaw, and then you do something. Air or voicing, and you say the word, and so on. Um, so this is the idea here is to, a set of pro, uh, steps, standard set of steps we use for every consonant, and kind of go in the same direction. Let me show you how this works. Let's do TH. I know some of your students have difficulty with TH. So, you're going to hold the stick in your right hand. <laughs> I have to think backwards here. That one, the right hand. Okay. Hold the stick in your right hand and scrape the tip of your tongue. 
like that, okay? Now, okay, once you've done that, now you can feel, you've sensitized the tip of the tongue. Now you take the stick and place it firmly against your lips right there, right? Real tight. Then next step three, touch the stick with the tongue. So bring the tip out, the tip of the tongue lightly to touch the stick, and then blow the air out, step four, blow air out for a count of three. So, think, right? So, scrape, set, touch, air, think, say the word. So that's always three, one, two, three, think. That is the most beautiful technique. The key here is that the tongue comes out and just barely touches the stick. That, that is just a beautiful technique, works every time. Students have to practice some, of course, right? <laughs> they have to have some words to practice with, but they can do this and they can immediately get a pretty good voiceless TH. Same thing for the voice TH. So this time, um, do the same thing, but instead of air, you put your hand on, on your larynx down here, right? So you got it set, stick is ready to go, tongue is touching, then this. And if you're a teacher, you don't have a hand to do this with, right? You have to move your head. So it's this. You say it, say it three times and say the word. That's the basic idea. It's so simple and so easy. It's, I mean, you have to practice it a little bit yourself so you can help lead students so they can see what you're doing. And you need sticks and you have to be able to throw the stick away afterwards because people put it in their mouth. You know, it's got germs all over it. <laughs> That's the main problem I have with this. When we do it, we have to have envelopes. Where we put the stick back into an envelope for students so they don't put their germs on the desk. In the room. Okay. This one's a more interesting for you because your students have difficulty with, uh, with one of these, with V. So this time, if you the same thing, you touch the stick on the wet dry line. So this is the line between wet and dry on your lip, right there, right there, okay. So students can feel that line. Then you take your teeth, put it down on that line, and then do the same thing. So you do touch, set, air, fit, fit. So touch, set, air, fit. Now, for very, can you figure this one out? Of course, same thing, same two steps. Mark, set, then voice box, very, very, same idea, right? So, touch, set, air or voice, and then you say the word three times. You get them to get to that point. Now they have to practice some words, you have to give them some words to practice with. And typically for like V, uh, to get them to begin using it a little bit, takes two weeks. They need to practice probably three times. We tell our students to do it in class with them quickly. Just see how long that takes? Nothing, right? We do that and then they get about three weeks. Two or three weeks working, you know, beginning to get words with V in it to kind of work it in. But it's very easy, very straightforward, right? But you gotta just, Steal some, steal some coffee sticks from Starbucks or something. Uh, here's the R. Your students probably have a trilled R, something like that. This is the Canadian R. I'll show you how to do the Canadian R. Um, this one, so just look at, this, look at the directions. With a stick, anchor the back left molar. Oh, excuse me, back left molar over here. So touch there so you can feel your back molar, the back of your teeth. Do it on the other side, okay? Now, next step, bite left by right. Bite both sides. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, what, you want, what we want you to do is you want to bite or, or feel like you're biting the back of your tongue on both sides, same time, like that, right? Okay. Now, so what you do is you take the stick and slide it under the tongue, like that. Bite the back of the tongue, put the stick here, underneath the tongue, and then do the word. Red. 
around. What you don't want the tongue to do is do this, right? So you're putting the stick inside so the tongue doesn't move, right? Red. Biting the back of the tongue. Stick here, just lightly touching here, underneath it, just underneath the teeth. Right there. Red. Now again, I love the trilled R. I love that, right? I'm not sure you need to do that one, but that's how you do it. That's how you get students to produce this Canadian R, or American R, rather than the, the um, Arabic, Arabic, I mean, Ar much like the Arabic R, the, the rolled the rolled R. <laughs> Students have difficulty with this one too, P, right? right? Um, same idea, same idea we just did, just look at the directions, anchor the wet, you're doing the wet dry line, right? Place right hand, so you place the right hand in the voice box here. Now, then you do, a, it says do B three times. B, B, B. So you want them first to feel the vibration with B. B, 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 B. And then do P. Still no vibration. But do B first. B, B, B. Right? And then blow out air, no vibration. So B has no air, basically, right? B, B, B. P has air with, with here. So the main thing is that they can feel the vibration here. Anchor it here, and they'll be much better at getting the P. Same thing, like pow, 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 bow, bow, pow, pow, bow. The problem with this for everybody is that you have that vowel right after the P. So students, too often, they, they get confused because they can't distinguish the P because they got a vowel after it. So you have to do the P in isolation. But the same, same concept, using marking, then practicing it with the vocal cords. Um, let me just, I'll just give you an example of what this is about here. Um, P versus B can be, a, yeah, I know that P can be a real problem, absolutely. But with a stick, you can, you can make it work, right? But it's important to sensitize the lips, to get them away, to get them focused on what the lips are doing with air rather than the vocal cords. That's the key idea. Constant clusters, I don't have time to, to work on this much, but let me just, the idea, here's the concept. The concept is that you do the second sound first. Second sound first. Like trick. So you put your, remember what I said about R, you, get, you bite your tongue and then say T, trick. Bite your tongue back here and then do the, and while you're doing it, then do the T sound, trick, trick. So if your R, if you're, you already have bite back here, the tongue has come back up, then when you do the T, they're said together. Instead of or tarik, tarik, right? Same, first you put the mark lips first. Space, 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 space. You do them together. Street's the same thing. Your tongue is in the position for R. Street, street. Pray, prayer, pray the same thing. You get the R sound before you do the P. Pray, pray. So you get the R ready to go before you say the P. That's basically the principle for that. And the last one is this, uh, like an X. It works on X. X. Well, most native speakers don't say that anyway. They simply say X. They don't. They don't actually articulate the T anyway, so don't worry about it. All right, we almost made it. Now, just a little little theory here at the end, then I'll stop and you can ask some questions. Um, what's this about? Haptic cognition, we talked about, someone asked at the very beginning about how do you explain this. This is it's this felt sense of pronunciation change, meaning feeling and sense. So you, sense means I understand it, felt means I feel it. It's trying to bring those two things together. And it's uh, Genlin, 1996, is the one who developed all this. This whole idea of, of trying to get keep both the feeling of something and the, the, the image or the symbol in, in your mind at the same time. Change activated consciously. This Lessac again is trying to use, remember I said you try and connect a sound to a gesture, then you use gesture to change the sound. That's the basic concept of it. It's amazing how often students can use a gesture for a sound, and they're saying it perfectly, but they can't hear it, right? And gradually they begin to hear it. So the gesture will change the sound often before the students can hear it. Um, 
And the last point there, integrating priorities. In other words, it's the idea of, of touch is to try and bring together visual, auditory, and kinesthetic together, to link them momentarily so you can keep them all kind of in, in your head, in your consciousness together, which is felt sense. The whole idea is this haptic cognition is the felt sense of you're doing. So you're not doing, you're not trying to just, it's not mindless. It's not just mindless repetition. It's very aware of what's going on and to connect it. Um, uh, this, 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 you can read this later, but again, it's metacognitive. These are the modalities, metacognitive, auditory, haptic. <laughs> Notice there's kinesthetic and cutaneous. The kinesthetic is movement, hap, and then cutaneous is touch. So we have movement and touch. And vocal resonance is meaning you have a, just like Lessac is big on vocal resonance. Lessac said that if you can get students to speak with more resonance, stronger, more um, richer sound, you can get them to change. So the idea of changing pronunciation is often, as long as you can get them to say the sound differently, maybe even louder, maybe even higher pitch, anything, to get them out of the way they're doing it now. Particularly if you have a man. Often men would have a low voice. If you can get them to work on the sound a little higher voice, often they can hear it, but they can't when it gets down into their normal pitch range. So it's all this idea of, of moving on slightly so your, your attention can be more focused on it. And the last one is very interesting, visual. You have to be really careful with visual when you do haptic work, just kind of a warning here, that visual distraction destroys haptic work. So you really have to focus inwardly on the sound, what it feels like. Maybe you can focus on the, the letters of the word, but you don't want a lot of things going on around you. Uh, typically in our classes, when we're doing this work, we try to clean off the front wall so we don't have a lot of things on the board so for people to be visually distracted. Visual is so powerful today that it'll just wipe them out. Um, no, I just said that. that that's all pre precision, light, visual, vocal resonance. Again, those are just basic ideas of really pronunciation teaching, not happening. I repeat a few times we said that. You know, homework, uh, PMPs. Again, it's basically for correction and recall. Um, we don't be doing, again, before you provide a lot of, a lot of modeling and so on, try it with, with the PMP, the sound that you want them to do. Um, and, and finally, for you guys, what you do, what can you do here? You can use a clock for, for vowel modeling, correction, vocabulary. You can use a butterfly tied to your fight club when you're working with um, phrases or, um, you know, uh, dialogues and that sort of thing. And, and finally, use the touchinamis, um, either just simple ones or just using the ones with a pen like I showed you for expression. And in fact, in fact, what I do is we use the baton for diagnosis. We ask a student, we give a student a, a passage with words marked. We want them to just move the baton as they're speaking and they get to those words. That is one of the best for me one of the best indicators of how, how easily they're gonna be able to change their pronunciation. Because that means that they're, 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 they have a sense of their body and their voice are connected. Some of the most difficult people to work with are what we call type A's, where <laughs> their head is disconnected from their body. Which again, that's a great thing if you're trying to get your PhD, you have to just go on, your, your brain has to go on and you can't worry about your body. But in pronunciation work, the body's got to be involved in the process. And there you are. Last page is we got some references there for you. There's my blog. Uh, if you want to do about research, there's some things there. Two books I'd recommend to you. Um, one is a, one of my have a chapter in. <laughs> but it's a good brand new book, 67 by Murphy. It's, and that basically shows you all these pronunciation courses and all these techniques. Um, uh, the, the book is a little bit light on haptic. Murphy is a little bit metacognitive. So there isn't as much kinesthetic as there should be, but it's, it's a brand new book, a nice book. And of course, maybe, maybe you know the other one. Um, well said, that's been around. That's third edition. That's a very, very popular book, but particularly for you people at academic level, Well Said is an excellent book. It's got good um, web resources. It's got both um, a beginning version and a more advanced version. Okay.
So, and finally, at the bottom, if you want to see his video of the PMPs, <clears throat> there's my, that's my website. You've got free videos there. You can see them. <clears throat> but if you're really interested in, in working with this, uh, get in touch. And I'll be happy to um, connect you up to some other things, free stuff that you can use and that sort of thing. Okay. Wow, we made it. Again, I really apologize for the technical issues, and it was, it was all my fault on this end. I've used Zoom many times, but for some reason, I was kind of asleep at the switch this morning, not enough coffee or something. So I'm, I'm good for a bit. If you have any questions, I know you, some of you have to leave. Uh, your time's up, but, but please go ahead, shoot. Any, any questions you have, I'll, be ha I'll sit here for another half hour if you want and take questions. So. How about teaching? I, L sound. Oh, L sound. Oh, okay. Well, I, I didn't do that. Uh, but I'll do that. Let's see what else we got. Other questions. I'll be happy to do L sound. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll start L sound while, while you're thinking. Got a stick? This is a really interesting technique. And what, we, what we discovered was if you want to teach L, you have to teach N first. And this is really a cool technique, one of the best ones we got. Here's how it goes. Remember what I said, touch first? So you take a stick. Thanks, gang. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Really fun. I really enjoyed this. You could use, use this. <laughs> this is my favorite subject, it turns out, right? right? So I'm going to do N. Well, I know some of you have to leave. Great. Been fun working with you. See you again. Uh, here's N. So take a stick and push up here behind your teeth, right? Got that? Okay. Now, do what like you do with TH. Probably you hear right. it, but it's distracting. But everybody, thank you so much. Right. Then what I want you to do is I want you to put the tip of your tongue up behind where you touched. There. Got that? Now, push up on your tongue as hard as you can and do M. Now, take your stick. Your stick here for your nose. And follow it up with your eyes. Mm, mm, mm. Got that? Okay. Now we got N. Now we'll do the same thing again. This will do L. Here's how you do L. This is fabulous. Watch this. Do the same thing. Touch back there. Touch tongue. Connect. Now this time we're going to go from here down. And we're going to do a very light L sound. Like this. Watch. So. Oh. Oh. Really important, the stick is here and your eyes follow the stick. Oh, oh. Now do N. Mm, mm. <laughs> now do L. Oh, oh. Now do the word nail. Nail, nail. Remember, when you go down, it's, your tongue is touching here as lightly as possible. Now let's do one more word. Take the word lane, lane, right? L-A-N-E. So you're going to go down first. Lane. Lane. So strong upward movement, light downward movement. Fabulous technique. That'll get it. Uh, we, do that with, we do that with the Japanese all the time, and it really helps them with the L sound. Okay, any other questions? You're welcome. Thank you. Fun. Great questions today. You guys have, I really have a couple of the terms you used today were really interesting. And I will, can we make pronunciation or class in the laboratories and teach it like biology? Yes, we should. Oh, good point. This is from uh, Alai Kudaish. <laughs> yeah, actually, that book I told you about, the one by Murphy, actually what it has is you have done in the lab. They do these lab classes where they do, they teach the basics. And then, um, then, what, then, then, you, then you, like I said, you, you do the metacognitive and the modeling in the lab, and then you use it in class. They actually learn how to do it by using it in speaking, listening, and reading and writing. I think that's the way. That's the way of the future. The future of pronunciation is web-based um, modeling and metacognitive stuff, and then teachers knowing how to do the kind of stuff we did today in the classroom. Absolutely, good one. Well, about the PowerPoint, 
uh, I'll be happy to send it to you. Remember I, what I told you? I'm going to modify it. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll modify it and I'll send it to uh, uh, Dr. Alhamani, all right? And then you can get it from him. That's good. Is it a good idea to sort out the difficult sounds and practice them or else? Yeah, I, I get a difficult. One thing I would say is that, that difficult sounds um, are really part of difficult words, right? <laughs> so, so the idea is that, that um, and again, you know students are going to have, your students are going to have trouble with, um, with P, right? So you may do a little bit of work with them like we did with the stick and so on. But basically, you, you, you work with words that they, they use. You, you do it in context, not just isolated stuff, right? Yeah, that, that's our whole approach to it. I'm, I'm glad you, I'm, thank you very much. I really appreciate your comments. Um, and I've got another webinar I'm doing in, in about, um, about three days and, and you, this really helped. I tried out some things with you for the first time. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you. Thank you for being my guinea pig. So I, I, that worked very well. I very, felt really good about that. Any more questions? Okay, everybody. Looks like um, I'm about to lose the mic. I thank you so much for your your great participation, all your questions and comments and your ideas. And um, I look forward to working with you again. And as we say, as us hapticians say, <laughs> keep in touch. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Acton, uh, for this wonderful presentation and to really open our minds to many things. And many ideas and suggestions. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for all of you who attended uh, this presentation or this webinar. We had uh, more than 70 people who were there during this uh, uh, webinar. It was really wonderful, and we are still here on campus. Uh, me and Dr. Al Habib is also in his office, and it's around now 11 p.m. And mashallah, we are trying to do our best. And inshallah, uh, we will uh, have another webinars uh, coming. Uh, we will, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, inshallah, soon. Uh, and Dr. Abdullah would like I'm glad to, you enjoyed it too. I, I certainly did. Uh, Dr. Abdullah will have uh, to talk to you for one minute, but let me talk to Riyadh. Riyadh, can you give uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Milhi uh, the mic or make him add admin? or host for this, uh, so he can talk to our colleagues. Uh, Mr. Riyadh Saab. Riyadh, look at the mic, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, okay, can you Dr. Abdullah, you're on. Yes, we can hear you. Loud and clear. Yeah, thanks, Doctor. It was a very, you know, uh, informative presentation. Um, thank, you, know, thank you, Masada. Much appreciated. Uh, appreciate your comments. To you and Dr. Nasser and uh, those, um, I mean, my colleague, our colleagues from the e-learning for um, their full support and being with us until this time. Um, I would like to let you know, and, and first I would like to thank all, all of our colleagues who uh, made uh, the effort, uh, you know, to uh, watch this wonderful presentation. It's, uh, it's a clear, you know, um, indication that they are so um, interested in future uh, webinars either from you or from, uh, you know, other presenters. I, I would like to thank you all. And um, before you leave, Dr. Acton, we will report you to the Starbucks for encouraging us to steal their, uh, you know, wood sticks. <laughs> so we will be reported for, for this, you know, encouragement in which we will steal, uh, whenever we go to a Starbucks or any kind of coffee shop, we will uh, still some of their, you know, with, with the steps in, in order to um, demonstrate for our students uh, how to pronounce certain, you know, uh, You're welcome, Rakshinda. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, thanks for, uh, for uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten caught. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> 
Okay. Anyway, um, thanks a lot. And then, yeah, uh, I've gotten caught at Starbucks stealing sticks before. That yeah, happened in Seattle, I think. Be That's important. Fun. You, will be <laughs> you have to be careful when you, you steal sticks. You will be important. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Habib, and also those from the e-learning. And most of it goes to you, Dr. Acton, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I hope we hope to see you in the future. Thanks. The mic is back to you, Dr. Nasser. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't have to anything to say. Just uh, as uh, Dr. Abdullah said, we thank our uh, colleagues at the e-learning. Uh, we have Riyadh, Asaab, uh, Ahmed Sholan, and also uh, Dr. Fahd uh, al with us before, for arranging this and helping us and uh, doing these all these uh, technical things. We thank them a lot. We own them. And inshallah, this is our first webinar, and it's uh, the first thing, inshallah, we will continue our work and cooperation with the e-learning, and they have been supporting us. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, you can leave. Uh, you can leave if you would like to leave.